So I had to go through, it's like an indescribable amount of pain, really. I have no qualms telling people that I have uh, cried over over trading more than once, um, especially during kind of the, the key, very painful phase where I really thought I had a lot of things figured out other than myself. And I hadn't begun the work, really, of figuring out myself. People put me on a pedestal in a sense in that way. And I love to let people know that I was a retail trader. That's my background. I went through all that pain. I thought of quitting. And the real big next level, I think, it's rewiring of belief systems. If you can do that, then all of a sudden, this is not a matter of self-control. It's not a matter of self-discipline. It's not a matter of, man, I wish I had ice water in my veins like Merritt. No, 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 no. He doesn't have that either. And now all of a sudden, this is the real, like there's any holy grail of trading. This is it. Welcome to this week's episode of the Alpha Mind Podcast. My name is Stephen Goldstein and my co-host is Mark Randall. This week we're delighted to welcome Merritt Black. Merritt is Head of Property Trading at SMB Futures and he's going to share with us his thoughts on a number of topics related to trading, mindset and performance. This is another excellent interview. Merritt comes to us with a lot of wisdom, experience and knowledge. And I promise you, you will learn so much from this, this podcast. So sit back and enjoy. Thank you. Well, welcome, audience, to um, another Alpha Mind podcast. And, and this week, we're pleasure of having Merrick Black on board. Merrick Black of uh, SMB Futures, a division of SMB Capital. Here with my co-host, Steve Goldstein. Uh, we're going to be exploring um, Merrick's journey over the years and what he's learned. Merrick, welcome welcome to the show. And perhaps you want to start by, I guess, introducing yourself. Absolutely. So I am in the future space, almost exclusively intraday. I think a lot of people in the future space are, are a bit longer term. Most of your CTA world and whatnot are, are definitely kind of the trend following swing trading type approach. But we're, we're building a desk at SMB Futures that's, that's intraday. Um, I was raised in a very kind of rural background. Uh, if you know, if you ever seen the movie Forrest Gump, uh, that's, that's where I'm from. <laughs> Got into trading at a, a very young age, actually fell in love with it in, in the sixth grade and uh, started reading books and just studying and getting everything I could get my hands on. And, um, you know, fast forward a couple of decades later and here we are. Um, I'm the head of futures and commodities for S&B Capital. Uh, so S&B Futures. And we have kind of a unique approach, I think, in terms of our HR process and the way we're going about building this desk. I'm a firm believer, and I do consider myself to have a pretty, you know, fairly high, let's call it an emotional quotient, emotional intelligence, um, a good read on people, things like that. But even with that said, I do not believe that I could sit across the table from someone, uh, be on a, a phone interview with someone, have them go through a questionnaire and know with any degree of certainty whether they're going to be a, a, a good trader or not. I just don't think I'm, I'm capable of doing that. And my, my history of, of trying to guess that in the past has not, not been great. So our choice, and, and we do believe that people should, any trader out there, any beginning trader listening to this podcast right now, we believe should be trading on a demo, trading sim, not trading live capital at first. We think you should first be able to at least show positive expectancy, show edge in a simulated environment, and then move to live. Does it mean that if you, if you are a, a fantastic demo trader, you're going to be able to translate that to live? Well, as you guys know from all your work on the psychological side of things, there's tremendous challenges that come with that. But with that said, long story short, our HR process is to allow anyone in the world, anywhere, to sign into a paper trading environment or our proprietary trading desk and show us that they can manage risk effectively with the parameters we set and that they can trade with edge all in a simulated paper trading environment with live market data, of course. And so 
if people can show us that, we're going to hire them. We're going to back them. We're going to start them small, trading, you know, one, two, three lots, very small. But over time, over a period of weeks and months and whatnot, if, if they continue that consistency from that demo environment to the live environment, we're going to continue to size them up and, and get them bigger and, and keep growing. So that's kind of what we're all about right now. Uh, we're, we're, I would say our niche is another offshoot from SMB Capital, the equities desk. Their specialty is building traders from scratch. So our specialty is not to hire the, the ex-bank trader and, and, and bring them into our system. Our specialty is really to develop people um, early on if we can get a hold of them and, and build them into CPTs. Very, very interesting. I, I think that's a very intelligent approach to position people into learning the mechanics of trading. So what well, well on you guys, I think it's very smart. Thank you for that introduction. How do you think that, that emotional intelligence plays out in your trading and, and how do you feel it gives you an edge in your trading? That's a fantastic question. Um, I kind of hate it off the bat because I said <laughs> one nice thing about myself and now we're gonna force <laughs> me to talk, talk about it more, which makes me very uncomfortable. Uh, but um, I, I do think it helps in intraday trading and I do think that there is an aspect to it of self, which is, which is actually an interesting kind of hot topic for me right now, which but I'm not going to head down that, that um, rabbit hole just yet. But we will come back if to you have <laughs> this, you know, emotional quotient and, 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 and whatnot, that's, that's pretty good. You are able to avoid some of the pitfalls that people without that might fall into. And it's, it's this ability to be self-aware ultimately is what it comes down to. It's, it's not just the ability to read other people, it's the ability to become what I would say consciously aware of your own thinking, your own feelings, and your own, let's call them impulses. And I don't, I don't wanna use the word impulse like traders always use the term impulsive in terms of a, a bad, totally negative context. When I use the term impulse, that's just, you know, everything starts from some impulse. And, and then as a trader, if you've got that to where you can become aware of those things in the moment, you're then able to do all the things which we could talk for another four hours about, which are to then incorporate process to then double check that the impulse or desire comes from what we would call market generated information rather than some mm -hmm. form of emotion. And yep. then you determine the best course of action, the best tactics to bring out and apply what you should do from that point. But if, if, you, if you're lacking in that self-awareness, what happens is there's an impulse and then there's actually a physical action. You click the button, you hit the hot key, you initiate the order, you exit a position, you add to a position, whatever that trading action may be, you do it and it's in a state that, that I refer to as autopilot mode. And this was something that plagued my trading. Even after I think I, ha I had a really good methodology with edge, I had a really good read on markets, I prevented myself uh, from being able to, to go execute said methodology flawlessly because I had too much of impulse just sitting there almost like you're you know how when you're driving especially on long trip and you come to a level of conscious awareness after having previously not been in it and you think wow what happened to the past four minutes what was i even were my eyes even open what was going on but of course you were driving perfectly you were staying inside the lane you know you were doing a good job so if you trade in that state i think it's very very dangerous and i think that emotional intelligence and I do think it's something that can be cultivated. Um, so I, I, I don't necessarily think that. In fact, since we said something nice about me, I will go ahead and be very <laughs> transparent to you guys and your audience. I genuinely think I was tremendously not cut out for trading. And it was a very, very difficult gnashing of teeth of, of, of journey for me. But I'm rambling, I think, now. But yes, uh, that emotional intelligence and cultivating self-awareness is huge yes yes i mean it's it's a great thing you've said and you know what you describe then is something that i've identified in you know I, i've been coaching traders now for about 10 years and i've worked with some extraordinary traders 
and some of them are extraordinary individuals. And there's very few that I recognize as having what I call an almost unique ability to somehow step outside themselves and observe themselves as if it's in real time. Mm -hmm. And that's a gift. But it's not a gift they have naturally. It's something they've cultivated over time. That's right. Gift. Even doing that from um, an, uh, um, an objective perspective is difficult. Okay. I think a lot of times even let's say that I did have a natural, decent self-awareness component to my kind of natural makeup. Well, I can tell you that back in the day, naturally, I may have had it, but it was extremely negative and harsh and critical. One thing that was really important to kind of take it to the next level of, of development, if you will, within this arena was to, and this is something that Dr. Steenbarker taught me, and that's the ability to do it and treat myself as I would treat one of the guys that I'm training. Because I can tell you, I did not treat myself uh, that nicely. And that had detrimental effects on my own development because it was just overly negative, overly critical, and it didn't help bring out my best during those sessions. What you're talking about, what I'm here talking about is self-compassion. Mm -hmm. And, and mm, if yeah. you speak to a lot of the leaders in these fields of trading psychology, Dr. Steenbarker talks about it, Denise Shaw talks about it. And I see this with these guys, you know, these really successful traders. It, it almost sounds like, you know, this is perhaps not a word we should be using in trading, but compassion for self is so important. Yeah, I think that um, if I look at it from a, a mindfulness point of view, and a sort of certainly from a military mindfulness or mind fitness point of view, I know that when the uh, the levies did their work with the Pentagon about uh, you know, the US Special Forces and, and uh, that certainly it was the compassionate mindfulness that was sort of the surprising powerful component of it. Um, that that sort of self belief, mm. that sort of that sort of connection with each other that was at such a deep level of respect. I'm going to cut in here because I just want to explain this story very quickly. Mark, as a broker, Mark taught himself mindfulness. You learnt it from a martial arts expert. Yeah, I'm the same uh, Mark, mine, yeah. Mark was originally one of the day day one brokers on the life floor when it opened in 1981. Uh, and broking futures can be a, an insane job at times. And he learned mindfulness also from the very same guy that taught mindfulness to the military special forces that then saw them massively outperform all other special forces mm. in international war games. And it was the compassion more than anything. It was the soft side. They thought the outcomes were going to be really sort of aggressive and positive and I, I guess managing the ego, with, which, which it did. But... The thing that was coming out was that people were a bit more, a lot more creative around their, you know, their theater of war solutions. Yeah. Um, but also mm. this sort of um, self-care requirement that if you weren't managing yourself at the level of being human, of getting back to that power and that intuition of being human, you started to become quite vulnerable. And you were at risk of being hijacked by, um, you know, cortisol and the stress reaction and and your sort of uh, awareness would shrink as a consequence of that. And of course, for people trading in the markets, you know, open an awareness to all that is going on requires you to have a, a kind of a mind that's kind of free in its observation of your senses and what's going on. Um, and that's switched off under a significant amount of pressure. That's just turned off. And so this ability to control yourself at a fundamental level of being uh, should be at the core of, of, of any role that's involved with trying to make sense of a volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous environment, which, which trading is. So uh, I'm, I'm very glad that you have found that through your own journey. Um, and I, I think it is a massive, massive message for the community listening that um, certainly those of you that are looking at you know, mindfulness, mind fitness and all that sort of genre, that one of the big themes in future that's going to be talked about more than anything else is going to be about compassionate mindfulness. Well, I, I think one of the, the big words that could be used for that just a, a huge deal for, for traders, and I think especially short-term traders, I don't know, long-term too, but it's, as you guys know, there's, there's challenges of short-term trading because things are flying at you fast. And even, even down to this compassion topic and, and these, these various things we've been covering, I think what that allows the person to do is to almost effortlessly, if it's there, 
effortlessly remain objective. You mentioned even the the, the chemicals or, or hormones or different things that would, would kick in with people. The, the real big next level of, if we kind of can continue to raise this conversation, I think is, how should we put it? It, 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 it's rewiring of belief systems, essentially, right. for where it's needed. If you can do that, then all of a sudden, this is not a matter of self-control. It's not a matter of self-discipline. It's not a matter of, man, I wish I had ice water in my veins like Merritt. No, 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 no. He doesn't have that either. I, you know, it's, it's not this struggle with the market and this just need it need and, and trust me I went down this path for a long time like you know I'm writing in my journal I'm doing my reviews come on you idiot you must do this tomorrow you must do this you must 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 you must garner this willpower to be able to do the right thing when ultimately the answer is more so around reshaping the way that you approach Thinking about markets and their true nature, okay, and that would entail a high degree of randomness and uncertainty. Uh, the way you approach thinking about what trading is, okay, and what trading is, at least the way we do it, is essentially like you're the casino, right? You have a slight edge. There's a random distribution of whether the next trade is going to be a winner or a loser. Therefore, we place very little importance on the outcome of the next trade or two trades or whatever. So being able to think in terms of probabilities in that sense about your job as a trader and what you're actually trying to do. Because what most people think they're actually trying to do as a trader is make money on the next trade, is have analysis that's so good that it yields them a winning trade, right? And that, that automatically sets you up to lose that objectivity. Why? Yep. Because now Objective. it's a battle. It's you against the market when all of a sudden things don't go according to these grandiose plans and even whether it's some conscious or not, certainty that you, you thought was there. And now you're at odds with yourself potentially, at odds with the market. Um, the objectivity is gone. All the filters come up. And now you're trading like crap, and you're not going to perhaps even know it until the end of the session, and you look up, and wow, I've fought a, a trend day all day. I'm an yeah. idiot, right? And do you know what? You know, there's, and I speak about this a lot, you know, this, this, this dual battle. You know, you have one battle with the market, which really isn't a battle because the market is not against you. It's something you're right. trying to navigate. But then you have this battle with yourself that is a true battle. Because if you lose that battle, and most people do, you're not going to succeed in navigating the markets. But if you can win that battle, and that takes many years, as, as you've discovered, and as I think every successful trader has discovered, if you can win that battle, your odds of successfully navigating the market, they jump, you know, they are a lot higher. It's it's still not a guarantee. Now it's, it comes down to your, your edge and your methodologies and your analysis. Yeah. Whereas you still you have know, to have a before, process, but, even if yeah. you had that, you're, you're, it's, it's being sabotaged and, and yeah. unable to, to be executed flawlessly. Yes. But I, I just think that's so huge is to, to, to move from even a, a state, and it does take time, and we have to reiterate that again, a state of even, as you mentioned, battling self to a state where you've na you now have learned to as all successful traders I know, think so differently about what markets are, about what trading is, what your job is, what you're truly trying to do. And now all of a sudden, this is the real, like if there's any holy grail of trading, this is it. Yeah. There's, no, there's no impetus for the fear, the greed, the... Um, the the all the discomfort avoidance mechanisms by the way most trading mistakes are some form of discomfort avoidance there's no need within yourself for those feelings and emotions to rise up for you to have to battle this is the magic in in, in my opinion it's what we train our guys yeah yeah and it and can it, be taught it can be taught it could be it's interesting because i believe it could be learned not taught 
Well, okay. I know, I know it's, a very, it's a very subtle difference. No, it should. You know, you can talk about yes, it. Yes, nurture, that's a good the way. learning of it, because a lot of people won't actually internalize that. Yeah. And the learning of it to me is when you start to internalize that, when you have those moments of realization. Oh, yeah. You know, and, I, war- and, I warn my guys when we go through what we call building a mental framework, I yeah. warn them probably a hundred times throughout that training material. You're sitting there right now, and maybe this applies to people on the podcast right now. You're sitting there. You like what you hear. It clicks for you. It makes sense. Maybe for some people who haven't heard this stuff before, it's even like light bulb moment type stuff. Wow, there's a better way. You sitting there nodding your head. 110% agreeing with what you're saying is nowhere near enough to make any changes to your trading. We are all, I think, as humans, not just psychologically, but biologically, as, as Mark has referred to uh, several times, we're wired to be very, very bad at this. That's just the way we're naturally made. So you can't just nod your head and say, yeah, these guys are talking about some good stuff here. I, I agree. I'm going to be better now. No, you're not. It takes sustained effort, consistent effort. You know, when 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 I got into trading, my goodness, do you think I I would be talking about self compassion and, and 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 talking about reshaping belief systems? No. When I got into trading, it's all about the charts and the sexy trades and you know, risk reward and and figuring out, you know, analysis and all that stuff. But really, this is just critical for people to be able to go apply the analysis and do what they need to do. Um, It's, it's, it's just massive. Well, that, that point you're making there is like saying there's a formula and there isn't a formula. Markets aren't like that. It's it's something like say you start to learn over time, and obviously you know for me and I, I want to come on to failure soon. Mm-hmm. Failure is the great teacher, oh, but yeah. also your success is the teacher as well. A lot of people don't do that. You know, look into your successes, and you will find some of the secrets hidden within them that actually are are, are almost like the source code. Well, that's one thing I think uh, Bella is so good at at our firm. Bella has really taught me to point out where the successes are, even small ones, on a daily basis, and build from those strengths. You know, all these traders, I think they want to come in and say, oh, you know, I did a crap job with this or didn't do any any good there. I messed up there, should have gotten bigger there, should have taken some off there, blah, blah, blah. And really, there's 10 other things that they did a really good job of that they're almost not even noticing at all. And you're, you're totally right that that if you will take the time and kind of restructure some of your review work at the end of the day to make to make a concerted effort in highlighting things that you did really well, it's much one, it's more difficult, I think, to find those things a lot of times because you take them yeah. for granted. Um, but two, as you mentioned, I love the way you phrase that source code for future success. It really is. Yeah. But yeah, failure yeah. is a uh, well, actually, one other thing with failure, too, I always tell my guys that true confidence in trading doesn't come from, you know, making money, P&L, that type stuff. True trading confidence comes from knowing that you can handle the worst. That's that's really where confidence starts to come from. Pulling yourself out of a drawdown, right? Handling a large, you know, setback on a day, Um forgiving yourself for really violating some of your own rules and principles and coming back and getting back to basics and, and building back up again. Things like that is, is where some very, very deep confidence comes from out of those failures. We will return to the podcast shortly. Alpha Mind is a collaboration between Stephen Goldstein and Mark Randall. Stephen is a former professional trader who now works as a coach to people and businesses in the financial markets. His business, Alpha RQ, provides mindset coaching to traders and investment professionals and executive and team coaching and leadership development to financial market businesses. You can check out Stephen's work on his website, alphaRcubed.com. Mark Randall has over 30 years working as a professional broker. Mark used mindfulness techniques to help him optimize his performance as a broker. 
Later, he started giving talks, seminars and workshops to corporate leaders and investment bankers about how to apply mindfulness to work more effectively and productively. If you are interested to know more about Mark and how he can help you in your business, he can be contacted at CEO at MarkRandallConsultancy.com. Now back to the podcast. Yes, that ability to, to sort of reset and recalibrate yourself and build that resilience um, and we don't typically store the, the fact that we're just having a good day. There's no real reason for us to store that anywhere. You know, when I work with people, I I suggest or recommend keeping a journal. And I, I always stress to start with what you did well. Mm. So I, I encourage them to do a weekly or at least a monthly review. What three things did you do well this past yep. month? And that's the first question. Yep. And that's about self-compassion. Recognize yep. what yep. you did well. Give yourself a pat on the back. And then I ask, mm -hmm. not what did you do badly, but what could you have done better? Which is, again, recognizing your areas of growth. You know, one thing I, I see, Steve, with, with people in regard to even if they identify things they can do better, they end up – this is just huge. I, this is just – I mean, I see this day after day after day and, and constantly. Um, this is like my current soapbox with people. They highlight XYZ didn't do a good job of that, really need to do a better job of that. And some people, that's the end of it right there. That's the review process. You've highlighted something that you need to do a better job of. But I dare say that that's not nearly enough. You have to take that to the next level. You have yeah. to go from identifying something that you, quote, unquote, need to do a better job of. And now I need to hear from you as, as your coach, as a junior trader on my desk, as someone I'm training. Well, how are you going to do that? What concrete steps do you think you can take to actually do a better job, as you generically point out that you need to do? So that's just a, something I'm seeing is just rampant right now in reviews. You've got to take it from identification to more concrete steps for improvement. Well, this is why I say I call, I call it a three-three-one review. Three things you did well, three things you're going to do you can you could have done better, and then what one thing are you going to work on going forward to improve? That's the one. Oh thing. yeah, process. It's hard goals. to work yeah. on more than three things. So if you can focus on one oh, yeah. thing, and then eventually, if you look back on your reviews, you see that that one thing eventually moves up to the top, and in future reviews becomes one of the three things you did well. And then you're mm -hmm. starting yeah. to improve. Yeah. But it, it, is, you're right. it, is so, it is so important. If you just focus on the negatives, all that's going to happen is you're just going to fail a little bit more slowly than you would. But if you can focus <laughs> on your successes, yeah. then you're going to find your source code growing to improving. Add it to your failures. The failures are where you, as we say, that's where you really learn. But they'll, you know, they'll that's transition the that teacher. mindset into their life in general as well. Yeah. So... A negative yep. mindset for trading will very often mean that their personal relationships are having difficulty, their work-life balance is all wrong, their sleep programs, just forget about it. It's all one big system working together. You, you can't just compartmentalize pieces of it. You have to start at the basic principles. If you get the management of the system wrong, it just doesn't improve in whatever you're doing in life and as a job. You know, we come to this job from education. Yeah. Some people come from another job, another career, but they tend to come in with this mindset that there's some sort of formula, some sort of magic equation mm -hmm. that if you just discover it and you just find it like a magic, a massive, you know, a magic chart signal that you just have to unlock it and then you'll succeed. And I say, no, you can't take that to financial markets. This is so complex. This is about you. You've got to. You know, you've got to forget that you're really intelligent, that you've achieved yeah. really good things at school or university or college or, you know, you've got a master's or a PhD. The market doesn't care about that. It also comes back to that randomness component that's specific to markets. All these intelligent people, all these hard workers, all these quick learners, they do think that it is more of that linear formula approach once you kind of unlock it. But the, the thing is, and it's, Look, you know, Mark could be the best um, 
technical and fundamental, full holistic market analyst of crude oil in the world. Okay. And all of a sudden, Mark has found the mother load of all risk reward, best trades, the fundamentals, the technicals, everything lines up perfectly. The best trade that's ever been put on in the world, Mark's putting it on. Well, guess what? Some sheikh in Saudi Arabia decides that you know they need to buy several more Lamborghinis or something, and they sell just thousands of contracts at the market, which messes up. And by the way, creates a butterfly effect, the domino effect of other momentum traders, other traders stopping out of positions based on this. And all of a sudden, the, all that perfect analysis based on what we could call, at least beknownst to us, a random event. The guy could, the, 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 the guy in Saudi Arabia could be bipolar. He could be, you know, go, going crazy. He could be selling for no good reason. There's no logic needed behind anything. So. This type of randomness that can destroy even the best, most perfect analysis in the world is something that a lot of smart people can't get around. They still think that they can find that formula that's going to give them a high win percent or, or, or more certainty, and it just doesn't exist. And the, the sooner you can come to grips with that and accept that as a trader, the more objective it allows you to be, the less you're battling yourself, the less you're battling markets, the less you're frustrated when you have a loser – the less you know, desire to yeah. not cut your losers short, all that stuff. And that one other thing with um, you mentioned, um, you know, coming down to you or self. That's that's kind of a hot button for me right now. I also think we do need to do a lot of sustained effort and 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 make a part of the work that we're doing on a daily basis on self in terms of improving those belief systems and and getting all those things in line that we need to be developing so that we can go perform very effectively. But beyond that, um, I think that too many traders get into this rut where it's actually too much about them, and they really need to chill out and step out of themselves for a while and make it more about the markets rather than about themselves and whether or not they – their routine was altered this morning because they ran out of spinach for their smoothie or, you know, just like all these things that they, I feel like a lot of traders, what's the, what's a politically correct term I can use on this podcast. They're just little you wusses, use, you, you I can, guess. You, you can, you, you can use unpolitical correct. This incorrect well. one. <laughs> <laughs> We've got two gray haired old boys here. We're not the most politically correct. <laughs> But, yeah, you know, we, people might call us dinosaurs. That might be one phrase they'd use for us. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, I, I, but I, you know, know what, what I mean about people who just yeah. get almost in this, like, they're on, like, this hamster wheel of It's about self. them. It's about uh, them. Yeah. It's their ego. It, it, These are the guys that wake up early. They need to be self <laughs> in terms of improvement <laughs> along these things that we've been hitting on. But beyond that… You've got to be self-aware so that you can make the focus about the markets and not about you. It's too much me. So it's and kind it's of a, a catch-22. but it, You know, it's, it's not really because it, it, it is simpler than well, – it's, it's not. I, I'm probably going to – I'm contradicting myself as I talk, something I used to do in trading. I like, I like this. No, Join I do the club. <laughs> but, I, you know, we um, – for, for the podcast we – well, we just recorded, which is – the one before this one, I'm getting a bit confused now. Right, so we, we did a summary of the previous six podcasts, and one of them was, of course, our summary of our podcast with, with Dr. Brett Steenbarker, and he talked about spirituality in trading, mm -hmm. and I think that's what we're talking about here. He talked a lot about how ego gets in the way, and this is almost a theme that comes up in every single uh, podcast at some point. Yeah. You know, it, it it's... I'm more important than anything else going on here, okay? <laughs> and when you do that, you shut off your ears to the market because the market is always talking to you. And great traders, we've, you know, in that summary of Dr. Brett, of Dr. Steve Barker's podcast, we both said great tra traders, they listen to the market all the time. The market talks to them. It tells them when yep. they're wrong. It gives them a clue. And there's a humility like, involved in that, right? Huge, huge. But the moment it becomes about you, you close that off. You know, and, and I try and get people I work with to try and imagine, rather than them 
just facing the screen. Let's imagine them in a, tri in a giant room or arena with all the other traders they're up against, all sitting there trading against them. And it's not just one Wembley Stadium full of people or one giant um, Yankee Stadium full of people. It's several, about 30 or 40 times those stadium, all yeah. out there, all also trying to play the market. And suddenly it's you feel a little feel smaller very, now, don't you? <laughs> yeah. And the moment you think it's about you, why the hell do you think you're entitled to succeed any more than any of those? Yep. You've got to look at all of them and see what they're doing. It's not about you. It's about the collective. Yep. And they're talking to you. And if you're smart, you can learn to read it. Not intelligent, smart. And that's where I come back to your emotional intelligence. Why I think it's one of the greatest gifts you can have, along with humility, which I can hear. I think also it's about balance. You know, having the appropriate balance and just going back to the extreme of paying too much attention to yourself. Yeah. And feeling that you need to do too many things. And a classic example is I, there was somebody I knew in the industry that uh, I think he, he went to sleep at about 11 o'clock at night, but he woke up at about 4 a.m. to do like two hours of meditation. But what he wasn't getting was enough. And he always looked exhausted. Okay, but what he wasn't doing, he wasn't getting enough but fundamental sleep. Extremely self-aware of how tired he was, right? <laughs> everyone, was, sleep. everyone else said, I guess how wasted this guy was looking. Um, here's how, well, you know, I'm primed, I'm eating like guacamole on toast every day, I'm doing my, you know, my five hours sleep plus two hours of meditation. And we said to him, look, maybe, maybe you need to be getting more actual sleep. You know, because that's when your brain sort of recalibrates, resets itself and gets itself ready for the next day, particularly during the last two hours of your, you know, sort of seven or eight hours of, of sleep. Uh, he just wasn't getting enough, but he was trying to play the game of like, he thought this was kind of the thing to do and the thing to boast about. And it was about him, about him, about him. And he also used to do wild river swimming, where he used to go and swim in, in sort of, ponds that were infested with like rat pee and god knows what else and he always kept caught these diseases and was always, <laughs> <laughs> because he kind of thought that it was the way of managing himself and like um he was like an iron man and like because he is an iron man he felt that he could bring that to the markets and he was probably the worst trader i've ever known because it was so much about him and and, and just this over sort of module of requirement of trying to trying to do what he thought was best but it was so so wrong it was just unbelievable so i think you can go to the wrong extreme in this stuff i i, I talk about you know i keep talking about this guy there was a guy i coached a few years ago who for me was the most perfect example of uh, egolessness in trading not that he didn't have an ego but in his trading he was so humble he had so much humility and it made him so able to read the market all the time and listen to it. But he wasn't perfect. He said to me, I'm not perfect. But, you know, he almost went that what you talked about at the very beginning. It was like he could see himself trading. <laughs> the most incredible gift mm -hmm. you can have. And that's what emotional intelligence, humility, yeah. balance, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, sort of. And sportsmen do that. So that, that visualization thing, I think but it's suddenly really you're not important. on the center, you're on the side. Yeah. And the market's at the center, which yeah. is kind of what you talked about. There. Yeah, definitely. Listen, I, I'm, I'm conscious of the time and we, we we've I, I want to try and bring in one thing uh, only because I, I know it's something which doesn't get much coverage. But it's the pain of trading. Because... Absolutely. And I know you've been wanting to touch on p failure and pain and that stuff. I'm, I'm happy to. I'm, I'm well versed. <laughs> yeah, it, well, that, well, that's even, even less than failure, because it's part of it, is that pain of trading. And, you know, I can go back to some points in my career. You know, you, you get into that hole and, you know, you kind of, you can't get yourself out of it. And, and you mm -hmm. feel so low and so empty. And, mm -hmm. and it, it's obviously a form of self-absorption as well. So it's quite pertinent to the conversation there as well. But I'm, I'm really curious about it, you know, what, what your view of it and what your experiences of it are. Because I think there'll be a lot of people listening who might think it's only happening to them or it only happens to them. To, to put it shortly, um, I literally used to refer to myself 
as a monster, if that sheds any light on how I felt about myself uh, during some of those darker periods of, of my trading life, uh, which severely bled over into my actual life. I have been, let's, let's say I'm, I'm cursed in my life to have some natural talents to be able to apply myself and go do things, whether it's picking up an instrument, you know, in high school and, you know, a couple of months later, I'm first chair, uh, whether it's deciding I want to get into triathlon, you know, and, and, and being able to go excel and different things like that. And again, I sound like I'm egotistical braggart here, but I'm just being transparent. That's just the way it's been for me in my life. So to come into trading and bring that type of expectation of you're good in anything you try, you can do it. it it's, it's setting yourself up for tremendous failure. And that was part of those that the weakness that I mentioned and, and how I was naturally very, very not cut out for trading and the ego that I brought and that type of stuff. So I had to go through, it's like an indescribable amount of pain, really. Um, I have no, no qualms telling people that I have uh, cried over, over trading more than once. Um, especially during kind of the, the key, very painful phase where I really thought I had a lot of things figured out other than myself. And I hadn't begun the work really of figuring out myself. And so I was constantly at odds with what I could see unfolding in the markets and the opportunities that I could identify were present. And then I wasn't able to capitalize on them. And so that brings about a, a high degree of frustration. You know, you, you, you work so hard and you do all this analysis and develop these techniques and it's all about the market. And so for me, it was like an extreme where I never even considered self at all. And turns out self was the problem. Um, and so I experienced a great deal of pain in that. I mean, there's so many times where I can, I can just remember just after the session, just pulling out my journal and just writing and just really laying into myself and being very, very negative and, you know, questioning whether I should continue, whether I should quit, um, you know, just even seeking out counsel of others in terms of, should I quit? Here's my history. Here's, here's kind of what's going on with me. Do I need to hang this up? Like, where is that fine line between perseverance and stupidity. You know, am I on the wrong side of this right now? I don't know. But all I know is that over and over and over, I'm letting myself down. I'm asking myself to come to the markets and follow this rule or, you know, for example, like don't trade more than three contracts and don't lose more than $500 on any one given trade. The thing that's really hurting you, Merritt, is your risk goes out the window and you size up too big, you think you know what's going on, and you get burnt. And that was kind of a repetitive thing for me because one of the things about me is I'm very naturally risk seeking. My whole life, I'm going to push the envelope. You know, I'm the I'm the uh, class clown in school who's going to say just these things to the teacher and do these things to just push that envelope until finally, you know, I get in trouble. Um, so very, very risk seeking. So not being able to rein in that and, and do a good job of self-coaching and, and whatnot. So, you know, risk plans out the window, blowing up accounts, all those good things after just begging myself and pleading with myself, you must do better with this. You must do better with this. But I didn't know how. Um, so anyways, I've been rambling for quite a while here about no, no, that was, pain that was and, and kind of where I've come from. Oh, Mer um, Merritt, that was brilliant. I was, I was sitting there thinking, you know, I, I was actually feeling it myself. It, it touched something deep inside me as you were talking about it. Um, you know, I, I, I've been there quite a few times. But I, I was thinking, this must be great for the audience listening to this, because I think they're also many of them are experiencing it many people listening to this will be retail traders who are thinking what have i got myself into am i the biggest idiot am i the only one going through this a few years ago i spoke to a, a guy who had, had fought in afghanistan 
who described the pain of trading as being uh, far, far harder for him to deal with than being under fire mm. from the Taliban. Mm. And, and he said, mm. you know, you, you, it was a different sort of experience. One, he could lose his life. But he said he never felt the same depth of despair as that that he was feeling in his trading. And, and it, it's, it's almost a unique feeling. And it almost sounds, you know, a little bit facetious to describe it like that. Uh, another guy who was a fighter pilot in the Navy said something very similar to me last year. It finds those spots. This job finds those spots like no other job can. And it's normal. It's normal. It's perfectly normal. Right, so I love reaction. to deliver that message to people and let them know. Because a lot of times people look to me at my position now or, you know, watching me trade or seeing my analysis or all these kind of things. And they get this sense that I'm like this, you know, superhuman trader or have these like it just was made for this and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and you know, this slightly kind of. They put people put me on a pest a pedestal in a sense in that way, and I love to let people know that I was a retail trader. That's my background. I went through all that pain. I, you know, thought of quitting and 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 thought maybe I should and 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 whatnot. And it's just I'm I am no I am as human and flawed and and not cut out for trading. As anybody else, maybe even worse. So <laughs> it's it's so it's very very important for for people to know. Um, I'm, I'm really, I've, I've, you know, your honesty has been fantastic. Um, but yeah. it's been such a pleasure and an honour, sort of, hearing from you. And uh, listen, it's covered everything we, we we more than what we wanted, right? It's about the common sense approach, knowing our natural sort of failure, risk of failure, and how we how we manage that. And the the vital importance of, of self and just realizing that and uh, process and appropriate management of just everything you do is is the way to get through it. So there's always hope. Always hope. Always yes. Hope. Yes. Any final thoughts yep. from you, Merit? Just to tie in with what you just said, um, community can be a, a a very very big big deal especially to the retail trader that is kind of going at this alone. And I've been there and I never could find that great community. And I will tell you unequivocally at S and B futures, we have a very, very good community. Um, it's full of people who are, are like-minded with me and, and, and are going through the same training program that we have in our students room. Um, and they under they all embody these things that we're talking about, and to be surrounded and accountable accountable to, um, and just going along this journey with other people that kind of speak that same language and and are in a very respectful type environment, um, we we definitely have that at S and P Futures. So I, I would encourage people to to come check us out and and see what we're about there. Yeah, great idea, great idea. Thanks for that. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, listen, thank you once again so much. And I'm sure that community, hopefully they'll, they'll listen to this podcast maybe many times. Um, Absolutely. So thank you. That, that, that'd be great. Thanks, guys. I mean, it, it was fun. I, I always love talking trading and, and love talking with guys who, who really get it. And uh, the psychological side is always just fascinating. So um, it's been a, been a pleasure. Well, thank you once again to Merit. That was an outstanding podcast interview. Some fascinating thoughts and perspectives shared. And, and we really delved quite deeply into some of the, uh, the more internal aspects of trading performance. And th these are topics which, which we're aware aren't, aren't discussed very often. And, um, you know, it's something we love to bring into these conversations. So once again, thank you to Merit for being so honest and open in sharing his insights. If you've enjoyed this podcast, then please rate us. Ratings help us get higher up within the uh, within the iTunes world and, and exposes more people to this podcast. So it would really help if you could do that. Uh, if you have any feedback for us as well, please, you know, please be willing to share that. And you can find our contact contact details on the podcast webpage at alpha-mind.net. Also, feel free to subscribe to us. Share this podcast if you've enjoyed it with friends, colleagues, peers. And, and also, we have some other resources on social media. We have our blog, alphamindblog.blogspot.com. And there we have articles um, and we have pages which offer details of books, 
other podcasts and courses which are resources for traders. We also have a group on LinkedIn which has over 15,000 members and uh, you know members members are allowed to post some of their own articles on there as well if they think they're useful to the group and you can also follow us on social media on twitter we're at alpha mind 101 and also we have an instagram page which is still in the early days and you know just uh, feel free you can also check us out on my company website alphaarcubed.com if you want to know more about me or Check out Mark on LinkedIn and, and our direct email addresses are stephen.goldstein at alpharacube.com and CEO at markrandallconsultancy.com. It's been a pleasure talking to you again this week and feel free to check out some of our p- previous podcasts. And other than that, just have a good week and good luck in your trading. Thank you.